Many other people would say I was on it way too long. Like I was doing 3DO games on my Apple II. What? <laughs> yep. This episode is sponsored by us. Go to retrocollective.co.uk to book a visit to the cave and the arcade archive. Come and enjoy the space with friends, let Alex and I make you a cuppa, and sign up for special events and guest speakers, such as the upcoming DJ Hoffman and Ted Dabney Experience Days. Find out more, plan a trip, or persuade your company to send you here on an away day by visiting retrocollective.co.uk. Hit the book now button to see our upcoming events, and we hope to see you soon. Our guest today has many claims to fame, an original esports champion, founder of game studios and developer of many of our most cherished video games. She's also described herself as a writer, marksman, pastry chef, nurse and loving mother. Here to tell us about her wonderful career in video games spanning over four decades, it's Becky Heinemann. Welcome, Becky. (laughs) Glad to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Now, I understand you grew up in, am I saying this right? Is it Whittier, California? Correct. You got Whittier. it right. Whittier, yeah. California. Which is um, yeah, very close to LA, about 30 minutes from Long Beach to help people put it on the map. Was this as exciting a place as it looks to grow up in, being so close to the bright lights of LA? No, it's no. The bar- <laughs> it's the barrio. I okay. One thing you have to look at the map is we're next to Pico Rivera. Pico Rivera was the Hispanic hub of uh, LA. So, you know, I don't look it, but I am actually Mexican. And so I spoke, you know, Spanish was my primary language. And uh, I I lived in the freaking barrio. Um, Now, granted, we lived in the suburbs. So it was more Americana kind of thing. But if you go into the house, it's Mexico. (laughs) Sure. I mean, you've got to understand. I'm, I'm, I'm coming at this as a Brit looking on Google Maps and saying, ah. "Oh, that's quite, that's close to LA." That's as much as I can extract from that. So, uh, yeah, there's obviously oh, a lot yeah. more flavor to it. Yeah, even though where I lived looked like uh, suburbia, as you, stereotypical suburbia, how, you know, picket house with a picket fence, all in, in rows and so forth. But the people there were mostly Hispanic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, California is is a big place. I mean, I know that if I look on a map and look at, say, Silicon Valley, that's a good seven hours. Away. That's a flight away for you, really. Oh, it's about a six hour, six, seven hour drive. Yeah. And I yeah. know I've made that drive numerous sure. times. You have. OK, so, so, you know, it's a lot closer to the action than most of us were. So mm-hmm. going back to the um, to the early 70s, did you feel any of the buzz of a new industry or did you witness the arrival of these first video game arcades that were coming out like computer space okay. or pong or um, anything like that arcades yes um any of <clears throat> any of the tech industry no because where i lived there was no tech industry that was mostly um potato chip factories and wood factories just industrial complex and oil fields um but for video games arcades <clears throat> Once the 70s came around, the late 70s, early 80s, video game arcades were pretty much in every single strip mall and shopping mall. So, you know, the, the, big, the culture of the arcade game, you know, took us like everyone else. Sure. So you weren't there sort of taken by the, the, the Pong, you know, the, the, the early arcades. It was more the Space Invaders era and that era that it came in for you. Uh, yeah, because as I understand it back then, Pong and other arcade games of that nature tend to first start showing up in bars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're a 13-year-old girl, you don't go to bars. (laughs) Um, So I was told by my parents, who occasionally would go to a bar, especially my dad, and they'd say, yeah, they've got this newfangled thing. I dropped a few quarters in it, didn't understand it, but it was kind of cool. You know, kind of that. And it's like, tell me more. (laughs) <laughs> okay so we, we've ruled out the sort of the tech industry we have ruled out arcades um in your earlier life so what did a young becky do for fun growing up in this area just so we can understand a little better where you came from what sort um, of hobbies work. did you have work 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 work, 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 work. because uh I, I left home when i was like 14 15 years old mm-hmm. i don't remember that it's so long ago now that things are fuzzy but i know at least by the time i was 15 i was not at home anymore i came from a very very bad family Mm-hmm. And we also didn't have money. I mean, we were pretty poor. 
I mean, thankfully we owned a house and stuff, but you could be poor and own a house back in 1970. You can't do that today. Um, but back then, um, I left home and I worked at JC Penney and I worked at other just grocery stores, gas stations, whatever it was to support myself. And um, so there was no time for fun. Um, but uh, when I did go to school, I met up with a friend who had an Atari 2600 video game. So I went to his house all the time to go ahead and play um, video games with him. Um, especially a game called Slot Racers. And he made it a point to one day he will defeat me in one game of Slot Racers. So that's essentially what I did for fun, was visit my friend's house, uh, fire up Slot Racers, and proceeded to murder him on a regular basis. <laughs> so d did you just find, like, the first time you sat down at an Atari VCS that you were just good at these games or did you have a lot of time to practice on them to beat it? No, I found I was just naturally good at them from the very beginning. I mean, I didn't do anything like uh, train or anything because I didn't even own a 2600. I, you know, it was whenever I could visit him, I would play. But then once I was done visiting, um, I had to go back to my boring, miserable life. And it wasn't until my parents divorced that I was able to finally have a home again. And I moved in back in with my mom, which then eventually led to me getting an Apple II and then later on in the, my own Atari 2600. And because at least I had a place to put them because, you know, when you don't have a home, you can't own anything. Um, but once I had a home, you know, I started, you know, do tinkering and had my own Atari and then led to the time where I was copying cartridges because I could barely afford the Apple II and the Atari, the 2600, but I couldn't really spend, because remember back then, cartridges were between $39.95 and $49.95 of $1979. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you're only making two bucks an hour, uh, two to three dollars an hour, um, it took a while to buy one game, which is why I had to resort to copying them. I'm just checking the uh, the old inflation calculator. So forty dollars from 1979, um, 163 dollars in today's money. Just to put that into context for one yeah. game, yeah, <laughs> huge amount of money. So I'm glad you've um you've kind of put that in order for me in my head. So you had the access to the VCS before you got anywhere near an Apple II, or did you have access to an Apple II before you got one? For um, the Apple II came later because it too was as there was another friend of mine who I met up and he had this Apple II. They just came out it was like 1977 he just got one he was playing with it and i came to his house all the time because you know when you don't have a home you tended to visit people to hang out at their house <laughs> and uh so i stayed at his house for a little bit and played with his apple too then i went to other friend and of course then went to work and work and work and of course when i was at friends houses sometimes i would like sneak into the shower or something like that to use their laundry or something but but that was only a short period of time in my life it wasn't like i lived that way for long it was only three or four months at most sure um, but, but you've, I, you've mentioned it a couple of times so you were actually homeless for a period then yeah and it was by yeah. choice because i ran away from home i mean honestly i could have stayed at home but uh, i had a very bad home life and i didn't want to put up with that anymore yeah sure so um you had your friend with the vcs and um you mentioned that you started to learn how to, to copy the games. I think a moment yes. ago you mentioned that. So just tell us about how you got the skills to do that. Was this all self-taught? Yes. Uh, I never went to school for any of this stuff. I just have a ferocious appetite for reading as evidenced by my library of books. Because on the shelves are numerous books. In fact, you know, those are all my Apple II programming books. Um, there's lots of paperbacks behind some of those games. Um, some of the books like the Apple II Red Book, you know, I still have that since the 1970s. Um, and if you had, um, if you had an Apple II and you bought the Red Book, the Red Book has inside of it schematics mm -hmm. and instructions and it expected you to be technically very literate. And anytime I saw something in there, I would ask my friend with the Apple II um, or I would go to the library or, you know, I would just go around asking people saying, so what does this uh, line with a triangle in it? I says, oh, that's a diode. Oh, what's a line with a squiggly uh, wavy line there? That's a resistor. What's the two thing? That's the capacitor. And then 
I would ask the next question, like, what's a resistor? What's a capacitor? Uh, and in time, I would learn all the, the jargon. And looking at the schematics, I would use that as a template because, like, my initial Atari 2600 emulator board was actually a ROM emulator. And if you look carefully at my design and then look at the Apple II integer card that was in the red book, you will find that all I really did was change like five lines and add one extra chip. And it's the same design, but I just simply took it, made it my own, added a little more. There we go. So it wasn't like I made the thing out of whole cloth. I had inspiration, um, but from that I built upon it, built upon it, built upon it until I was, you know, one of the biggest Atari 2600 pirates in all of Los Angeles. <laughs> you make it sound so simple. So uh, the the learning of the electronics, was that driven by your desire to better understand the VCS and to pirate the games? Or was it just the coming together of you just happened to be learning electronics and then the VCS came along and you, you put the two together? Uh, both. both. Both, okay. It was both. It was the fact that um, this is a part of my life in which I was a ferocious consumer of knowledge. Um, I just was curious and I never stopped asking questions such as like, again, what, you know, what is the 74 LS 244? What's the 74 LS 245? Oh, one's a monodirectional eight bit latch and the other's a bidirectional eight bit latch. What does those two say? And what's really sad is I still remember those. Those are the actual part numbers. Um, and I still remember this because, you know, I was memorizing all this stuff, making lots and lots of notes, making, um, you know, putting stuff together. And of course, what also helped me a lot was at the time, Radio Shack was a, it's a ch it was a chain of electronic stores, but in addition to selling radios and eight track tape players, they also had an entire section devoted to parts. And when I say computer, when I say parts, I'm actually talking individual components, like individual resistors, capacitors, uh, sock chip sockets, the chips themselves, wire wrap tools, breadboards everything a maker could need to be able to take this stuff home and build your own Apple II peripheral cards out of parts. And a Radio Shack was not that far. It was actually in the same shopping mall when I worked at JCPenney in the store. So I would go to get my paycheck, run to Radio Shack, grab a bunch of parts, then run home. And then I would spend the next couple of days with a wire wrap tool and schematics. And of course I would wire something up. Oh, I didn't do that right. Unwire it, put it in. I even had a, a D wire wrap tool as well. So, <laughs> um, but through, you know, trial and error and um, just tenacity, I was able to design these cards, which allowed me to copy these cartridges. Yeah. And so you mentioned this emulator card. So this was a card that you put in the Apple II and what, you could just run 2,600 games on the Apple II? Or how, no. how far did it go? No, okay. It's, okay, when I say ROM emulator, it's literally what it is. On the Atari 2600, in the cartridge, there is a ROM. Generally, the ROM is 2 or 4K in size. So what I realized was if you just made a card on your Apple II that had 4K of RAM, static memory, which is trivial to make it act like a ROM, but it has read-write, when it's set to the Apple II side, it's just 4K of RAM. So I just load the game on the, from the disk, copy the 4K into the RAM. Then I would hit a soft switch, which would then tell the chips that, okay, disconnect the RAM electrically from the Apple II, but wire it through this cable, which then plugs into a combat cartridge, I, combat cartridge which I pirated and, and put this cable into, which then... Now it looks like electrically as a 4K ROM. I plug this into an Atari 2600. I turn on the 2600. There's the game. Incredible. Okay. So presumably then the RAM is volatile. So every time you turn the Apple II on, you've got to put your disk in to, to load. You're, yep. you're effectively loading the first person probably to load a 2600 from disk <laughs> in a roundabout way. In a roundabout way. I mean, I can't, I won't claim I'm the first because I mean, I heard on bulletin boards and stuff that people were thinking of doing this and stuff. And I'm, I'm certain somebody else did it. Sure. Um, it's just that I also did it too. And so I then copied the cartridges and with that, uh, you know, became very popular on the 
wear sites. So like later on, the Apple II wear sites would go to the BBSs and they'd say, so what do you got to trade? We won't let you into elite <laughs> status unless you got trade. How about 100 Atari 2600 games and the schematics so you could build your own ROM emulator so you could play the games? And it says, you're in. You're in. You've got a You're ratio. In. You can download whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, I had <laughs> elite status on so many BBSs at the time. Um, so, and of course, back then that was the badge of honor. Whereas today, it's more like um, you know what uh, what's it called? What forbidden Discord servers are out there that you have access to makes you leap. Where back then, it's like, oh, I've got an account on the pig stack. Ooh, I've got an account on Starbase 74. I got an account here. I got an account there. And it's like, okay, um, you get cred. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you did have cred. I mean, you were doing this at about the age of 15, um, do, doing this, uh, yep. this pirating. Uh, 15 was around when I started doing this mess, and I kept doing it to my mid-20s. I mean, I was working in Interplay, and I was working at Boone. I was still doing this crud. <laughs> So, um, you know, all this is going on and then something quite amazing happens. Um, you know, aside from this, you become a, a champion video game player. So um, <laughs> let's just talk us through how you found yourself getting into these video game tournaments. Well, it was all because my friend, the one I told you about who I visited playing the Atari 2600, he was the one who dragged me in. He is the one who changed my life because otherwise I would have never, ever considered going into actual professional professional video game programming because in that particular time in my life, my self-esteem didn't exist. I had none, none whatsoever. It would have been beaten out of me by my family. I would have been, I would very much likely have been in an alternate dimension. Um, I would have been just a blue collar worker, probably driving trains or trucks for a living or something like that. Um, because I would have thought I was worth nothing more than that. Even though I still knew electronics and stuff, um, I said, yeah, but yeah, I know electronics, but everyone knows about me. Because back then, even though this, this technology came so easy to me, I thought it also was easy to everyone else. Same goes for video games. I kept creaming my friend on slot racers and he just kept, demanding a rematch, another rematch, another rematch. Well, for me, I just thought there must be something wrong with my friend because this game is so easy. How can he not figure out the tactics? How can he not figure out a strategy? How can he not figure out that if I'm in this position and he's over here in the maze, all I have to do is shoot to the right and it would go this way and the maze would go right to him. How can he not see that? Um, because to me, I just look at the screen instantly, I know, okay, shoot this. This is the entire path of the bullet. I shoot this way. I go this way, shoot this, you know, cause you can shoot left, right, or straight. And every moment I just said, okay, shoot now this direction. And then it would just go hit all around these corners. And then it would shoot, hit him from behind. He was like, how the hell are you doing this? <laughs> and I go like, can't you see it's right there? Well, he was a member back then. We don't have BBSs or anything like that. So what video game companies did to reach out to their audience was that you add yourself to a mailing list. And when I say mailing list, I'm talking about U.S. mail. Mm -hmm. And what you would do is that Atari had this thing called Atari Force. And what you would do is the Atari fan club and Atari Force was their mascot. And what you do is that when you buy an Atari cartridge, there would be a coupon in there, like a little uh, postcard. You'd name it your name, address, etc., and then you'd mail it in. They would add you to their mailing list, and then they would mail you advertisements like every three months. And the advertisements usually were booklets of all the new games coming out. Sometimes it would say, hey, if you tear this page out, mail us a coupon with some money, and we'll mail you a cartridge, blah, blah, blah. Sure. One day, they mailed a flyer. And the flyer was coming to your town. Space Invaders is invading Los Angeles. On this day, it was like October 10th, 1980, I think, give or take a day. Um, we are going to be at the Tabanga Canyon Plaza. And for a $1 entry fee, you can go ahead and play for a chance to win an all expense paid trip to New York City to play in the finals. It was mailed to my friend, not to me, because I wasn't a member of Atari Force. But he got it, and he says, you should enter. And I go like, why? Because you're so good. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just normal average player. He says like, no, you really are good. So he can just kept 
nod and like nagging me over and over again saying you got to go you got to go and i said fine i'll go and then at that point on the appointed day we hop in his car he then drives the two of us i was like 16 maybe i'm not sure i think no i hadn't turned yeah i was still 16. um drove over there to topanga canyon where they had a long long line and of course when i saw the lines i was like <laughs> i'm gonna get slaughtered um but i went ahead and paid my dollar and got my coupon got in line now the line moves really fast because what I, we didn't know nobody said anything about this they played space invaders on game number one which is the typical game but on b difficulty which means that your base is twice as wide right the whole so intent yeah, the whole intent is that you get murdered in 30 seconds. I see. Right. Okay. And presumably, you know, you knew you were going to this tournament. So did you get some practice in beforehand? No, not at all. No? <laughs> None at all. Because it's like, A, at the time, um, while at the time in my life I did it on Atari 2600, I played Space Invaders like maybe five or six times and go like, yeah, after clearing a couple of dozen boards, okay, I'm bored. Next game. <laughs> sure, I mean, sure. the games I was playing mostly was Superman and Adventure at the time. And of course, Slot Racers. Every time I was with my friend, it was Slot Racers um, because he was a glutton for punishment. Uh, but back to what I was saying was that he, we then went to the contest. The line moved really quick because the game was hard. So basically, they you know, got to my point, got my ticket, went in. Um, they took me to the tube kiosk if I'm trying to remember it, um, where it had an Atari on one side and another on the far side. And I just gave my kit ticket to the judge and all the judge's job is to make certain I wasn't cheating because there was a cheat mode in the, the Space Invaders that you turn off the console, press the reset button, hold it, turn on the console. And then when you let go of the reset button, you get to fire two bullets instead of one. Ah, which okay. give you. So they were there to make certain that I would not activate the cheat mode. That was instant disqualification. So the guy then says, okay, ready. He holds the reset key and go. And I start playing and playing and playing <laughs> and playing and playing and playing. So I'm like, so what do you do? How'd you get to work here? What's going on? How's the weather? <laughs> um, you know, you know, do you do this often? Do they have you travel with the, this group or they just hire you locally? I don't know. Um, but it just, I was bored out of my mind because, you know, you, space invaders it's just dun 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 for about an hour a solid hour of this crap i just went on and on and on and i'm like i am so bored and then finally the aliens just get past my defenses and land on me so i was like okay um what's my score goes eighty-eight thousand. is that good um Okay, um, so he hands me the, the the paper that says I scored this many points on Atari Space Invaders. Thank you very much. Blah blah blah. Get out. Um, so as I was leaving, I had some people from Atari. And this is this actually happened. <laughs> some representatives of Atari came up to me and said, um, "Do you mind if we don't post your score right now?" I'm like, "Why was it that low?" I said, "No, no, no." <laughs> You're like the highest score we've ever seen. Um, we don't want to scare people away because, you know, we want to get the dollar money. And now, of course, granted, the money was going to charity, if I recall correctly. OK, um, but it was still like they just didn't want to scare away uh, potential um, contestants by seeing some crazy score. And I'm like, I don't care. Um, because you know, there's probably someone right now beating my score or have already beaten it and they just have because they don't record your score until you, you end the game. So as far as I was concerned, like half the people there already had like a hundred thousand points for all I knew. Because that's how I felt. That's how I thought. Uh of her. so I said, sure, why not? So uh, my friend and I ran around, got some food. Of course he played too. He got like five hundred points before they <laughs> got him. Um but wandered around, and of course, when the time was around five-ish, I think it was, again, I, this is kind of like fuzzy because it is over 40 years ago. I was somewhere around five, five or six o'clock. That's when they were announcing they're closing it up. And of course, that's when they post my score. And there was one person left after they closed it that was still playing the game, but the aliens got him at around 44,000 points. 
So had, again, an alternate reality, had that guy beaten my score, he would, or he or she would have gone to um, New York instead of me. But once they said, nope, that means your store score still holds. Um, you're the winner. So they uh, took my name, address, phone number, all that stuff like that. And I said, okay. And they gave me like, I think a check for like a hundred bucks or something like that, because that was my prize. I think it was 150 bucks. I'm not sure. Which is like, I'm rich. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you won the regionals, you cashed your check in. Um, yep. And then how and soon forgot after, about it. And then probably forgot about it. Now, how soon after was the, was the nationals? Was it a- one month later? One month later. Okay. Yeah, one month later. Now for me is after the, we went home and I said, great, I just earned all this money. Yay. Um, and that was, I thought the end of it uh, because it didn't really sink in uh, all expense paid trip to New York that didn't sink in. Um, but then like uh, a week before, like around the end of October, very well, the first days of November, I get an express mail letter. And I'm like, who the hell would be sending me an express mail letter? And, you know, from Atari, like, oh, cool. Open it up. And in there is your packet, which has the itinerary, this plane ticket, et cetera, for one. <laughs> to put it in perspective, since this was the very first time anybody had ever run a national tournament in which kids would very likely be the winners, no one had ever thought that... <laughs> If you gave an all-expense-paid trip to the kid, that they would come without their parents. Because the other contestants, their parents actually had means so that they themselves paid for their own flight to go with their kid to Atari to go ahead and uh, participate in the event. I came alone, and they asked me, so where's your parents? Like, do you think we could afford a plane ticket? <laughs> Uh, we barely could afford to make our mortgage payment, let alone, you know, a plane ticket. Uh, yeah. And like, uh, your mother lets you go? She says, no, I just left. I just left my house. And literally, my mom didn't know I was even there um, because that's how estranged I was from my family. But uh, even so, even if, you know, she wanted to come, we couldn't afford it. So that um, was your first, your first plane trip, was it? It was, it was yeah. a Pan Am 747. And I'm like, I got, I still remember the plane going like, man, it's huge in here. <laughs> this thing flies. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So you, you, I, yeah, I think it was my first plane trip ever. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and then, and then, you know, you went on to actually win that, yep. that national tournament. You know, was it, did it feel as easy as the regionals for you? Did you breeze yep. through it? It, it yep. was just as boring. <laughs> um, it was more, um, it was more staged and organized, Sure. but nevertheless, they still didn't realize that <sighs> when people play space invaders on hard difficulty, yes, a vast majority of people are murdered in about a minute to three minutes tops. But when you have the five best video game players from five different cities, someone should have thought about the fact that. How long did each of these pers- people play to get their respective scores? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and of course, for some of those, you know, they would have probably practiced before they came here. So they're probably better. Um, so what had happened was that we got into this room. They put us on this raised dais, which a table in front of us with TVs above our heads because they wanted the people behind us to see the game. Right. Yep. But unfortunately, that meant because normally comfortable viewing is the monitors directly in front of your face. But instead, it's up here, you know, about maybe, I guess, 10 centimeters above the top of my head. So I would sit in the chair. Now, this is a standard folding chair. This is not a really nice chair. I would sit in my folding chair with my back up and I would look upwards. And that's the pose I had to be frozen in for two freaking hours. Because... Yeah, they thought the game uh, originally was supposed to be sudden death. Play, basically, play to last man standing. That was the rule. Yeah, yeah. And so pres- presumably, you could also see all the other competitors' screens then, so you could have a look and see how you were doing by comparison, or did you just focus on your own? Uh, focus you on your own. Because yeah. when you're yeah. playing a video game, you, you especially something as intense as Space Invaders, you can't take your eyes off the screen even for a second. 
Uh, because like when you're in the end part where there's only one alien moving back and forth on the screen, you only have like four to five seconds to shoot it. Otherwise it lands on the ground game over. And it's, you know, so it, it's every one of us had to be absolutely focused on that screen. They, they, in fact, like I remember when I was playing during that time in my life, you know, that two hours, it was just that joystick, myself, the monitor, and there was nothing else in the entire universe. Because that's all that existed. And, until I heard the voice saying, and now concludes the Atari 2600 National Space Invaders Tournament. And, you know, and even said the first annual. So it's like, yeah, they were actually hoping to do this every year. So, <laughs> okay. So they just, they just ended it then. It, it was, it didn't yep. come down to last man standing. They nope. just cut it short. Okay. Yeah. Cause uh, 20, yeah. 20 minutes into the game, the guy from Chicago got landed on. So from their point of view, it's like, okay, one down, four to go or three to go. Um, nope. Two hours later, the rest of the four of us were still going. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and how close was it at the end? Um, it wasn't that close at all. I mean, my okay. score was one hundred sixty-five thousand. Number two is like one hundred and forty thousand. It just means that in the end, I had the most aggressive playing style because that's literally what it boils down to. Is because they changed it from last man standing to sudden death. It was whoever had the aggressive uh, play. Now, not to fault the other players, mm -hmm. if you knew it was last man standing you may have wanted to play a very conservative game because it increases your chances that you will be able to just outlast everyone else. So my, my strategy had risks, and I do know my base was shot at least once. And they, in this game, three lives, that's it. Um, so therefore, I was grabbing points. I was shooting as fast as I could. Um, it just, I had better accuracy and so forth. And I also had timing to get the UFO all the time. So my play style just happened to be the one that was scoring the most points. So when they changed the rules at the last minute from conservative, don't get killed play to grab as many points as you can. I just luckily was the one who was using a strategy that won that type of game. So it could have been, like, for all I know, because of my strategy, I would have been maybe the second or third person out. Mm, um, yeah, but yeah. it's one of those things that now we will never know. We will never know. But what we do know is that you didn't actually win the prize that you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so first prize was an Asteroids arcade cabinet. Exactly. And yeah. the second prize was the Atari 800. Was, would With it have been all the trimmings. Would it have been an XL or just an 800? Oh, point? it was. No, it was an 800. Remember, the XL wasn't out yet. Yeah. This, okay. is, uh, no, this is um, November of 1980. So I don't think the XL was a thing yet. Uh, but they had an Atari 800 with the RAM expansion and basic and a disk drive, which just came out. And it's yeah. like, ooh, I want that. <laughs> I'll put it next to my Apple II and I could do bad things with this. Um, but you won. So you, you won. Did you actually get an Asteroids arcade cabinet or did they offer you an alternative? I, I, asked, them, I asked them to change it to a Missile Command tabletop. Reason? Oh, okay. There was no way in hell I was going to fit an asteroid in my <laughs> bedroom. My bedroom is a tiny little bedroom. In fact, I couldn't even fit the missile command. I had to leave it in the living room downstairs with because uh, my mom lived in a small condo. So even though it was two stories, this house is maybe a thousand square feet total. So five hundred square feet on the top, five hundred on the bottom, and that's it. Um, so when it finally got delivered in this box, I then, um, you know, unpacked it, got it running, plugged it in, played it for like about a half hour and go, I'm bored. <laughs> and that was that. It just became a coffee table. It became a coffee table. <laughs> so in video games, then in this competition, you, you know, you got success and recognition and, um, well, you were presented with an opportunity, weren't you, as, as a result of this. So just tell us what happened next for you. What, what opportunities came up? Oh, as quite a few. I mean, yeah. uh, during the time that I won, um, I was, I got my 15 minutes of fame in which mm -hmm. I got all these people, you know, shoving microphones in my face, asking me how it felt to be the champion. I'm like, I, I don't know. I just played the video game for two hours and my, my hand hurts. Um, so after that um, wonderful, wonderfulness, I then um, met up with Arnie Katz, Bill Kunkel, Joyce Worley. Now, those names are familiar in the industry because they're the ones who created Electronic Games Magazine. 
which at the time was the premier magazine dedicated to video games. You know, others came later, but at the time, that was the magazine. And they asked me if I could be a writer for it, in which I would write articles every month about how to beat a specific video game. So like Pac-Man, I do an article on Donkey Kong, I do an article on Tempest and so forth. Because of course, if you're good at Space Invaders, you must be obviously good at every video game ever made. You know, there is some truth to it, but it's not the complete truth. <laughs> um, but it did um, inspire, um, I think it was Del Rey or Pator Books, I can't remember. They wanted a book written. And of course, me being a high school uh, dropout, they brought me a ghostwriter, a guy named Tom Herschel, I believe. And he actually wrote the book, but I'm the one who told him how to do it. So this is how you beat the game. This is how you beat the game. This is how you beat this. This is how you beat that. Blah, 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 blah. And uh, we wrote two books. One was called How to Beat the Video Games. And the other was called How to Beat the Home Video Games. Okay. Um, yeah, I was reading a book today, actually, down, down at our museum. I think it was called How to How to Get Good or How to Be Good at Video Games. And it had a section in the back of exercises that you could do to get better at video games. And one of them was tell a friend to hold a pen and drop it. And then you have to react and catch that pen. And that will improve your reactions for video games. <laughs> and there were all sorts of exercises like this. Now, as a champion video game player, did you ever perform these exercises? <laughs> nope. I never heard of that. Um, yeah. No, um, my trick was very simple. Imagine this uh, comb right here as an Atari 2600 handle or video game handle. Normally you're told to hold the handle with your hand like this and then move the joystick around. I held it with two fingers near the bottom. The reason is that here you need to move your hand a great distance to, to push a button. You move here to push a button. But if you're down here, you have to make a very slight movement to go up and down. So you have an instant reaction time. So by holding it here, you know, up, down, up, down. And I noticed the other players that were playing it at the space, they all did the same thing too. Right. So they all figured okay. out to, in order to shave off some reaction time, just hold it from the bottom and then just go click, 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 which we now use today as the game pad. Cause you know, with the game pad, it's just a little thing. So you put your thumb on it and then you instantly move, just move it with a very slight movement you can get there. You know, we figured out game pads before game pads were a thing. You know, secrets from the professionals. <laughs> so you had that, this is how, that is how you shave off your reaction time. There you go. So you had this opportunity then came up to be uh, a writer and, and presumably, you know, you were you had writing skills. You were quite comfortable doing that, were you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I was comfortable. But again, it's back to self-esteem. It's which. I had to push myself to do things because I had that little voice in my head saying, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be horrible because that's the thing I was told by my parents all the time that you are horrible. You are terrible. You will be amount to nothing. So that's what I believed in. So I had, you know, for writing, I had to get past my writer's block, which was, this is going to be crap. So don't even start. Don't even try. And it took decades of therapy. And uh, I'm not going to kid you. It took a long time for me to break that conditioning to be able to be, you know, what I am today. Have you ever gone back and revisited um, any of the articles that you wrote and and just sort of reviewed? Oh, them? I cringed. I cringed. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I look at them and go like, "Oh my god, I actually wrote this." Oh. <laughs> Because now, of course, as years, I, I taught myself actual writing skills and read, how do you write? How do you properly do characters? How do you do this? So I would look back at this stuff like, oh, <laughs> bury, burn it. Oh, please burn it. <laughs> it's just also it's the same. Like I would look at the source code of some of my old games. And I look at them and go like, I actually wrote this crap. <laughs> it's like, OK, what was I thinking? Not much, I guess. <laughs> it, it served a purpose, though, didn't it? It served a purpose it because it was a stepping stone to what came next, which was, um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, was the next step to Avalon Hill? Was that where you went? Yes. Next? Yes. Yeah. What had happened was that we had to backtrack a little bit. As you know, I was making Atari 2600 cartridge copies. 
I was, as you know, I am never satisfied with status quo. So I would look at the ROMs and go like, well, what's in this ROM? What data is in here? And by the greatest coincidence, the Apple II uses the same microprocessor as the Atari 2600, meaning that all the disassembly tools that work on the Apple II work on Atari cartridges. <laughs> so I was able to look at the ROM and say, hey, this is 6502 code. What happens if I change that? Now we put it up on the cartridge. Oh, the background is now blue. Okay, so this register changes the... So in time, I taught myself how to program the Atari 2600. Unbeknownst to me, um, that was a skill people were willing to pay insane amounts of money for. Because in order for you to make Atari 2600 video games, you either had to hire an engineering firm to do the reverse engineering for you, which usually would be $20,000 to $50,000 of 1980 dollars or the cheaper way is to hire an Atari engineer. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because then they would bring in what they knew. Because the thing was that the Atari 2600, once you learn how to program the Atari 2600, it which takes about maybe three or four days of training, then it's kind of training that you could actually teach others and you don't really need notes or books or stuff like that. Uh, it's unlike, you know, saying, hey, I learned how to program Windows. It should be easy to teach anyone else to program Windows. Like, uh, no, there are people who work on Windows for years and they still don't know even half of what's there. The Atari is just a tiny, like maybe eight pages, maybe nine pages of documentation. And that's everything. Um, and of course, you know, tips and tricks might be 50 pages. But once you have that 60 page document, there really is not much more they can teach you. Um, but I learned this all by myself. So Avalon Hill, like everybody else, wanted to get into the Atari 2600 video game market. Because like everything else was, the market had never existed before. So nobody ever knew things like, hey, you know what? Is there an actual top to this? As in, is there a point in which um, there's too many games? They just thought, hey, you know, you make games, they'll just buy them regardless of what it is you're making. So good for you. Uh, well, that's not how it worked. Um, uh -huh. So like, um, I don't know how much you know about the history, but there were companies like uh, Quaker Oats. They make breakfast cereal and they bought a company called U.S. Games and U.S. Games was a division of Quaker Oats. At least Avalon Hill had some excuse. They had a history of board games, so they were gaming yes. in a sense that they yeah. could adapt. Yeah, so did Parker Brothers and Milton Bradley. They mm. all, like Milton Bradley came up with a thing called the Microvision, and Parker Brothers came up with like Spider-Man and Reactor for the Atari 2600. Like I said, everybody and their brother was jumping into the market. Avalon Hill wanted a taste, and they made <laughs> board games. So, And they did computer games back then, too. So when they were, they asked the people Electronic Games Magazine, know anybody? I said, yeah, we know this kid in LA. And uh -huh. they called me up and said, hey, I'm, uh, you know, we're Jack and Eric Dot of uh, Avalon Hill. We understand you make Atari games. I said, yep, I do. Would you want a job like making video games? You're actually going to pay me for something I do for free? Sign, where do I sign? From research I've done, some have said you were 16, some have said you were 17. We, we, oh. Do you know which one it was when you went to I was 18, 18, yeah. even though my age wasn't there. I was 18. <laughs> you you I were was, 18 on paper. <laughs> I was on paper. I was 18 for three years, okay? No, four years, because <laughs> I was 15 when I first started getting work. And, of course, back when I was 15, I was 18. Uh, and then, um, then later on, when I entered the Atari 2600 thing, you know, to get on the plane, you know, they said, oh, are you 17 or 18? So I'm 18. Yeah. Because otherwise, like, where's your parents? You're an unaccompanied minor if you are not 18. It's like, nope, nope, I'm 18. <laughs> um, so I was 18 for quite some time. <laughs> but no, when I went to work for Avalon Hill, I was 17. Yeah, um, was, And you had to move away for the job? Oh, yeah. I had yeah. to move to the other side of the country. Now, granted, because of my estrangement from my family, getting 3,000 miles away from my family was like, Cool. In fact, can I go to England? Maybe Germany might be nice this time of year. And as much distance as I can get between me and those people, um, I'm I welcome this with open arms. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And then um, the first games I've got. Correct me if I'm wrong. The first games appear to be 
out of control on the 2600? Uh, the first one I first? worked on was um, London Blitz. I keep oh, thinking Blitz, yeah. uh, UXB because that was its original working title, uh, Unexploded Bomb, UXB. Uh, but it was uh, London Blitz, and then afterwards was Out of Control. And, of course, I had a hand in the other three games, but they were other programmers really deserve more credit than I do on those games. Yeah, so London uh, Blitz, that was on the 2600 it, and the C64. Did you work on both? Or was no, it just I only did the Atari 2600 version. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they could have easily taken the source code and looked at it. And the game was pretty simple because it was essentially a variant of Mastermind. It starts off with a big maze. You get an alert. You have to drive your car up to that particular spot. Then there's the bomb. You need to defuse it. And it literally is Mastermind. It's saying, here's three colors. You, you pick it and then undo the bomb if you succeed. And if you fail, well, then game over because you blew up. Yeah. And these were all new games that you programmed while you were there, or did you have any sort of part completed projects or games that you'd nope, already well, made them all home? up? Made them you all made up. Made them all up there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And was your development setup the same as you had at home? Did you take that with oh, yeah. you? Yeah. Well, I was the one who built their dev kits. Um, that okay. was my job. As soon as I arrived, they set up this one area for people to program. We had Apple II set up, and I went to Radio Shack and bought like a grocery bag full of parts <laughs> and i spent the next gosh two months one or two months nothing but building these stupid cards and i built like 10 of them um and they used them for all their programmers to do atari 26 so like some were used for the testing department so that when the game was being you know finalized we would have it tested and played because remember once you manufacture those cartridges there's no backseas you can't put a, a thing so that game had to be completely bug free start to finish you could play no issues otherwise you can't ship it so i had to build dev kits for the people who play tested the games as well as all the developers um i know that uh, in the closing months of avalon hill we actually had a we're going to do a circuit board of it, we're going to print a circuit board and then mount all the parts on it. So instead of having this wire wrap thing, which every now and then I had to repair, so I had a part time job repairing these things. So someone would say, Oh, my dev kit isn't working. I would pull it out, try to figure out what's wrong with it, fix the wires. Usually, like a wire got loose or something, tighten it up, put it back in the service. So by making circuit boards, then we would have gotten rid of that thing. But then uh, very shortly, then the market completely and utterly collapsed upon itself into a black hole. And that was the end of it. <laughs> yeah, so we're talking around about 1983 here then, aren't we? The, yeah. the, the North American video games crash. I left Avalon Hill around late 80, early 82, uh, late okay. 82. Um, called up a friend of mine in LA from the hacker community and said, hey, I'm coming back to um, LA. Um, anybody hiring programmers? And he says, yeah, there's a company called Boom Corporation. They're looking for programmers. It's like, okay. So as soon as I got off the plane, Went back to my mom, who now lives with her boyfriend, so it's a different place now. Uh, but he was actually the first person who actually tr he treated me like a child, you know, like their child. And he acted like a father figure to me. So it's like, you know, Robert Bach, I will always be eternally grateful for you to actually show me that I had value. You know? um, but uh, so I'm like, okay, finally, a family is actually somewhat functional. Um, but... Um, I was notified about uh, this job in uh, Costa Mesa, California, which is about a 40 minute drive from Whittier. Um, so went down there. And as soon as I walk in the door, I said, here's what I do. This is what I did. And, oh yeah, I also programmed Atari 2600 games. I'm like you did? I said, yeah. Well, we got a contract with KTEL Zonix taking their Atari games and porting them to VIC-20. You're the person to do this. It's like, yep, I can. All right. Uh, Get to In fact, I got to work literally like the day I came in. I came in, they said, can you work? Here's a station for you. What do you need? So you need an Apple II, I need this, I need that, blah, blah, blah. And we all got the stuff together, set it all up, and I had a job. Um, but of course, a 40-minute commute wasn't going to fly, so I got myself an apartment near um, their offices and moved in there. And so I was able to walk from my apartment building to um, Boone Corporation, and I would walk by this burger joint, which, you know, there's a story there. Um, but uh, <laughs> that's my uh, next programming job. After my, that's my third programming job. There was a job I did at HBO, Time H Warner HBO, for like a few months uh, in New York City. Um, okay. But that was like, not, no one saw, the, none of the projects saw the light of day. So there you go. Um, okay. So you went to Boom. 
Yeah, you mentioned the burgers briefly. We should mention that your nickname became Burger because of your uh, <laughs> your habit of storing the burgers in the in in your office drawer. <laughs> yep, because the thing is, again, with self worth issues, I never asked for a salary, so I ever I just took whatever they paid me, which was always minimum wage. Right. So here it is. I'm an Atari 26 programmer at Avalon Hill and at Boone, and I was making minimum wage. Which in the United States, you could barely live on that. Barely. Today, you can't. But back in um, 1981, 82, you could, but there's no extra for money. So therefore, um, I had to you know, economize by buying burgers and lots of 20 at a cheap hamburger shop, a uh, place called Hamburger Stand. And I would store them on my drawer because I couldn't afford a refrigerator. You must look back at that situation and, and, and what they were paying you now and think. Oh, I look back yeah, at it with a lot of advantage. revulsion and hatred. I mean, um, you, know, er, you know, Boone, I really is like my own fault. But Interplay, yeah, I went on way too long without ever asking. Because I never asked for a raise during the whole time I worked there. And it was all back to my self-esteem issue. But now I look back and realize how badly I was paid hmm. and how much money I made for the company. Um, I, uh, you know, there's some resentment back there because of the fact that I was instrumental in keeping that company afloat numerous times. And yet uh, other people are trying to claim that, Oh, it's because of theirs. No, it's because you exploited people work under you. That's how we were able to survive. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned interplay there, which, um, uh, which came next? Brian Fargo, Jay Patel, Troy, Troy Worrell, and yourself. So mm-hmm. you were. Yep. We you all were the, worked at Boone. We you all worked when, at Boone. So that's all of came. us worked at Boone. See, that's what happened. Was that it's not like interplay with some vision. No, no, no. We all worked at Boone, and then um, Mike Boone says, "Well, I'm not going to do video games anymore. I'm going to sell popsicles at the swap meet." Not kidding. Um, that's what he did. But to Mike Boone's credit, he then went to Boone boards and then make made millions so okay so yeah. he made made the right decision for himself he, there. yeah he made the right decision for himself but for us we're all unemployed we're all sitting around the lunch table going well um what are we going to do now well i was like is atari, atari hiring and of course since this was um late 83 we're like everybody i know is fired they're all looking for jobs what are we going to do um well let's just form our own company and we all like we got everything here you know let's just make your own company company and just take some of the contracts that Boone's no longer going to do anymore. Use our contacts. And next thing you know, we got some, uh, uh, a loan from a guy named Chris Wells who loaned us $25,000. It was more of an investment. Um, and we form interplay. Now, of course, let's look at this. Chris Wells, Brian Fargo, the Wells Fargo jokes just wrote themselves. (laughs) I mean, we had Wells Fargo jokes so many times, but uh, it was about a year later when we got when we sold the Mind Shadow contract, um, which like a hundred grand, I believe, give or take. Uh, we were able to buy out Chris Wells, and then he went on and did because he was just a financier; he was not anything in dev. He was the person who basically gave us the seed money to start Interplay. But once okay. we did Mind Shadow Tracer Sanction with Activision, which gave us like a hundred grand. That's when we had money to basically buy him out and then had enough to just continue on until now we became the most spectacular explosion in 2002 ever. (laughs) Oh my God, that was horrible. horrible. Just jumping back to 83 when you set this up then, obviously um, the person who invested the money, they they decided there was still an opportunity to be had despite the market conditions, despite the video well, games industry falling apart. And you obviously thought there was an opportunity there. Oh, yeah. Well. See, the thing was that the video game crash was affecting consoles, the mm-hmm. television, ColecoVision, the Atari. But there was this new market coming up, home computers. And remember, Boone, I was doing games on the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. So mm-hmm. we were doing Atari games. We were taking them from Atari and putting them on other consoles, and they were selling pretty decently. So when Interplay was formed, the first thing that we did was games on the Apple II and the IBM PC, which, as you know, came on 81, and games were just starting. So we did these educational games for World Book Encyclopedia, 
Um, and then, of course, I did Tracer Sanction and Mind Shadow um, as text adventure games because Sierra Online was making a bunch of money doing those type of games, like Wizard and the Princess, Time Zone, uh, Dark Crystal, etc. Yeah, Mystery and House. And Mystery all those House. Ones, yeah. We yeah. wanted a, a taste of that. So we had a much better engine, a much faster system, and uh, we then started marketing our own little games. And uh, it led us to a long-term contract with Mind Shadow. Sorry, with Mind Shadow with Activision, which is why Mind Shadow, Tracer Sanction, Task Times, and Tone Town, and Borrowed Time all four were released at um, Activision. But sure. of course, the problem was is that as time went on. Um, that particular genre of games started waning because people didn't want to type in verb noun, like Infocom games with graphics. They wanted something more visual like uh, King's Quest. Uh -huh. um, but we were more focusing on going into the RPG realm. So instead of doing our own King's Quest-like game, because like when I was doing Task Times in Tone Town, I was making the foundation of doing a click adventure engine that would be very much like what King's Quest did. But... Um, when it became the sales were just not where we want them to be. Um, we then refocused and went over to do, um, RPGs, RPGs Bard's Tale, yeah. and so yeah. forth, which of course was a good decision because, you know, we made a bunch of money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that's interesting then. So you followed a little bit more like the UK market over here where we were much more microcomputer centric. So we were less affected by the um by the video game crash over here um and in task times on tone in in tone town you actually i believe developed um a mouse driver so you had mouse support yep. very early on 1985 um also mm -hmm. appeared on the amiga as well so you were working yep. on multiple platforms mm -hmm. um did you looking back say 1985 did you look at what you were doing and did you think you were on the cutting edge of of entertainment did it feel that way at the time Nope, not at all. Nope. It was, <laughs> nope. I mean, like people ask me about Bard's Tale, same questions. Like, did you know when you were making Bard's Tale 3 that it was going to be the greatest selling version of Bard's Tale ever? And I'm like, no, I was just making a game I wanted to play. Yeah. That's it. It's just like when I was doing Mind Shadow. I liked uh, Mission Asteroid. I like Wizard and the Princess. I wanted a game I wanted to play. And so hence Mind Shadow was something I would play from start to finish. It was fast. It was easy. It had animations. It had, you know technical improvements over what was done by other people. Um, but in the end, it was told a story and stuff that I thought was compelling and it worked when, so when we went to, at the same time, I wrote all the tools at Interplay that generated the art. So like when you're playing Mind Shadow, before Mind Shadow had to be written, I had to write an art tool. So it's a full art editor. So you can go put there, draw little palettes on the back and so forth, which was a mouse interface. In fact, the first version used an Apple graphics tablet. Okay. Yeah. And the Apple graphics tablet was then used to draw the art. But then later on, when the Apple came out with the Apple mouse, I think it was like 1984, I promptly bought one because I always was getting the newest toys. And then I learned how it worked because again, insatiable Apple tag for knowledge. I then took the you know, mouse, put a mouse interface in there. So now you can either use a mouse or a graphics tablet. And I added a koala pad. And then it was like a whole bunch of other input devices. Because eventually the game, the, the art tool was released by Mediatronic. I think it was either called Quick Draw or um, Quick Paint or, some, or Paint Deluxe or something for the Apple II. But that was my art tool. Once the art tool was done, then I was able to give it to the artist to start drawing all the art in the game and then wrote the game that draws the art, which used most of the code from the art tool. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, so you were developing your own tool chain as well as your own hardware, yeah. which, um, I mean, you obviously carried on doing for a long time because we would mm -hmm. like to see, is it Burger API that you released for Burger all to Lim. use? Yeah. Yeah, to, to develop their own games. Mm -hmm. um, in, in later years but you, you also mentioned the bard's tale there um which many of my listeners will be familiar with so mm -hmm. what part did you play in that series when did you come in and start working on the bard's tale was it from the beginning was it from the beginning in the series yeah. um i was okay. the person in the chair um what had happened was that there's a guy named mike cranford he was an old high school buddy of brian fargo and mike cranford went and did his own things but eventually Fargo wanted him to come do something with Interplay. Far, uh, 
Mike Cranford had a game called Specter Snare. Um, it was a prototype of the game and it was based on a game of his called Mates of Mardigon or something like that. I probably miss mang mangling it, so I could be wrong on those. It was like the Maze of Mardigon, which was a Commodore 64 cartridge. So if you ever saw that game, you could see the seeds that started Bard's Tale. Um, but he came in here with an idea for a sequel, which is going to be called um, Spectre Snare, because it's named after the weapon you're supposed to use at the end of the game. That's why at the end of Bard's Tale, you get the Spectre Snare. Um, well, the idea was, what if we take our art team, who's already done several games, because at the time they already did, uh, task time, sorry, they did Borrow Time, Mind Shadow, and Tracer Sanction. So why don't we have them do these really nice looking monsters for the game, use our animation tech, um, because something came straight out of Mind Shadow, except again, improved, um, and then use this basis of the game engine and make a full RPG. And maybe we can get someone like Activision or Electronic Arts interested in it. And a deal was struck. So they were using my art tools, my art chain, all this stuff. And I worked with him on improving the code and so forth. Uh, but he was the lead and um, we shipped the game. But then of course I was the one who had to do the ports because it was this brand new machine called the Apple IIGS. So I took all the source code, rewrote it all, made it for the Apple IIGS and that's how we get Bard's Tale 1. Um, then Bard's Tale 2 was done. I then ported Bard's Tale 2 to the Apple IIGS. Uh, and then there was that infamous falling out um, because with Cranford because you know, he wanted one thing Interplay wanted another. There was no meeting of the minds. There was a separation. Um, Is this where there, there was an event where um, the source code was kind of held hostage? Was that was that this game? That was Bard's Tale 1. Yeah. That was Bard's Tale 1. Yeah. 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 Because the thing that uh, my desk was next to Fargo's and the walls are paper thin. So everything, I mean, I know so much about how Interplay was working because I was just sitting there <laughs> at my desk. And I just heard him just either shouting at vendors or begging for money for credit from not really people for credit, but basically like, you know, hey, you owe us money. When are you going to pay? You know, we, uh, Becky did this thing called uh, racing destruction set for EA. When are we getting paid? When are we getting paid for this? When are we getting paid for that? So, so I can see like, yeah, because, you know, and of course, he would be calling in payroll like hours before it closes because like I just got the money to make payroll. <laughs> so I too was like going like, oh God, do I, do I have to look for a new job soon? <laughs> <laughs> um, long story short, after Bart's Tale 1 uh, got out the door, Cranford had a better deal because Fargo signed whatever it was. Um, but part of the terms was that Cranford gets to work from home on Bard's Tale 2 and has complete creative control. Maybe he got annoyed by me saying, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. Or the other one was just my constant insisting in, in the, asking him, why can't we have female characters in this game? Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe got tired. I don't know. Those are things that uh, only Cranford can answer. So I'm, I'm speculating on my end. Sure. Um, but what happens though is after Bard's Tale 2 ships, it was, did it, did well, but it didn't set the world on fire. So in other words, as far as EA was concerned, the franchise was like, eh, you know, what do you got that's new? And hence, that's when Wasteland was being born at Interplay saying, well, we've already done the fantasy and Ultima's hot. So let's do a Ultima style game set in a post-apocalyptic future. And they went ahead and set up a whole about 10 people were on the staff of that particular game. Um, because they were thinking that this is going to be the new hotness. And I was saying, like, well, I want to do Bard's Tale 3. And, of course, they're looking at me it's like, you don't know anything about the Bard's Tale code. You don't know anything about that. I mean, you had nothing to do with the game. So it's like, I rewrote the freaking game for the Apple IIGS and these other ports. Um, I know this code better than any, but heck, I know the code better than Cranford. Um, I could easily do this. So I was given a tiny budget, and there's only four of us. You know, there was Kurt Hyden who did the music. Todd Camasto alone did all the art. Um, Mike Stackpole created the story. I did everything else. And um, the four of us just went off and on our own. And we were basically, you know, every now and then, you know, 
uh, someone would come in and say, hey, got all these ideas. You'd be like, yeah, yeah, sounds like a great idea. As soon as they walk out there, we're not doing any of that. <laughs> None of it. T- tore it up and throw it away. It made them think that, they, oh, yeah, I had contributions to the game. No, you didn't. We, we just let you think that because you're going to ruin the game. We already know what we're going to make. And it was always boiled down to, I made the game I wanted to play. Yeah. And I made yeah. the game balanced and fair and so forth. And, of course, female characters. <laughs> duh. Um, that it was, it wasn't hard at all to put female characters in there. So it's like anybody who argues saying, oh, it's going to take a long time. Put, no, you just have to actually want to do it. And it just happens. But once now Bar's Tale 3 was done and Wasteland was nearing done. So of course, Electronics like Bar's Tale 3. Okay. Maybe, uh, we can give this franchise a shot, especially since we're going to be doing it for like a low price, considering that we didn't, you know. Yeah. We didn't really pay that much because, you know, you had such a tiny team. Um, but they released the games nearly simultaneously. And Bar's Tale 3 wiped the floor <laughs> in <laughs> sales. It was the hottest selling version of Bard's Tale, um, of Bard's Tale 3. I wonder if it even beat Bard's Tale 4. I mean, I'm not sure. Um, because I don't know what the... Um, you know, I don't know what the sales are of the, the, the recent Bard's Tale 4 game. But I do know we sold a ton of Bard's Tale 3 games. And then I did the Commodore version. Then I did an Apple II G- uh, a GS version, but that didn't ship um, because the GS market kind of died then. Then there was an Amiga version and a PC version. So what was uh, the primary system that you developed Bard's Tale 3 on? What was the, the Apple first II. version? On the Apple, Apple II. II. It was primary it done on Apple II. And then every port was based on the Apple II source code. Okay. <laughs> and um, you mentioned your push for better female representation. And, and you had the chance to do it within that game. Were you aware of anyone else out there trying to to push for that as well? Or did you feel that you were alone in that? Drive? I felt I was alone. Remember, you mm-hmm. have to look at the context of the time. This is 1986, 1987. Um, communications between people, you know, social media, it was just private BBSs. Mm-hmm. And the BBSs tend to be more just technical BBSs hosted at college dormitories. So it was vastly male-dominated. And, you know, and most women, we had to use pers- uh, male personas because sadly, in many cases, as soon as they found out that you're a woman, you get sexually harassed. Hmm. And yeah. or secondly, we would get um, how to say it um, diminished or um, I'm trying to find the proper word for it. But basically, it's we would be immediately cons- just our opinions didn't matter because you're a woman. Mm-hmm. So dismissed, that's the proper word for it, dismissed. So anytime there's a conversation, anything we would say would be immediately dismissed. I mean, there's a running joke about board meetings in which a woman would say something, no one would hear her, then her male compatriot next to her would say the exact same thing, and immediately everybody goes like, that sounds like a great idea! <laughs> and of course the woman's like, I just said that, he just repeated my words. Um... <laughs> That is the culture of that particular time, which is, of course, not very complimentary, but it is what it is. Um, so, I mean, like to put it in perspective, while I knew that Roberta Williams was making the Sierra games, she wasn't really known. Uh, and don't forget, there was Carol Bradshaw. There was uh, there, there was all these female programmers making things like Centipede and River Raid and so forth. But you didn't know who they were other than by seeing a package that says a female name. But that's really about all it is. It doesn't really sink in. Um, because you see so many uh, male programmers, designers, etc. You may have been familiar with their code when, when you were ripping off their cartridges. <laughs> there was that too. <laughs> Yeah, there was quite a few cartridges. I looked at the code like, what were you smoking when you wrote this? <laughs> but then again, I would look at some of my own code back in the 80s and I'd go like, okay, what drugs was I taking back then? Because I don't remember. Because uh, for one, like I never took drugs. So it's like, well, obviously I have totally forgot that. <laughs> it's a long time ago. It's a long time ago. I was ago. young. I needed to work. <laughs> yeah. And you also mentioned the the competition between Bard's Tale, Tale 3 and Wasteland. Was that a healthy level of competition within the company? Do you think? No. Is that a good thing? No. No. Because the, the trouble was is that um, certain people at Interplay at the time were starting to develop egos. 
And they did not like the fact that people were rubbing it in that their decisions or their faith was put in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying Wasteland is bad. Wasteland was actually an awesome game. But the trouble was is that they believed that Wasteland was going to be the game that sold a million units and Bard's Tale 3 might get 50,000, 100,000, a little break even because the genre is tired. No one cared about it. Instead, it was the reverse. Mm -hmm. Now, remember that with Wasteland, they at least they were um, inclusive. So they had female characters of a soul that um, race, sorry, the sexism only existed in Bard's Tale 1 and 2. It did not exist, ever exist in Wasteland. So the only difference was just the presentation of the games and one's post-apocalyptic, but it's a brand new franchise versus Bard's Tale 3, a third installment of a very famous franchise. So in many ways, I did have an unfair advantage. Hmm. Yeah. But nevertheless, when people started playing it, they go, this game is great. I love this game. It's so well balanced. It's huge. I mean, the first game at 16 levels, the second game at 25, I had 70. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, well, and, and more you know, inclusivity, more story, more scripting, because I had all this technology I, I created specifically for the game. Yeah. Um, and of course, later on, it inspired me to, uh, I wanted to do um, Bard's Tale 4 and start work on it, but then it eventually became Dragon Wars. <laughs> Yeah, and that brings us actually to our first viewer question. Uh, questioning, I mean, it, it's quite an open ended question. It comes from uh, Rich May. He asks, How did you make Dragon Wars so awesome? <laughs> it's the same thing. How did I make Bard's Tale 3 so awesome? Same excuse. I made the game I wanted to play. Uh -huh. That's exactly it. It was when I was doing Bard's Tale 3, the storyline had to be linear because of the way the game was designed. We had the seven lands, uh, Gelidia, Malifia, Tarmidia, um, Kinestia, Tar whatever. But in order for you to progress, you had to first start off at the refugee camp, solve the puzzles, get strong enough to go to the first land. Then you have to solve all the puzzles there, go to the second land, third land. So, But that inspired me saying like, what if I make a game in which the doors to all seven lands are available right now. Mm -hmm. And then now you have to play the game to go to the first land, which then goes to any other land. You could solve either two or three, but then once you do that, then you have to go back to the first land again and so forth and make a far rich game text, text wise and adventure wise, but I don't have to make 70 more maps. <laughs> and um, hence the idea of um, Dragon Wars, you know, of course is working titles bar still four. Because, you know, if you look at the code, it is Bard's Tale 3's code. <laughs> I mean, it just, of course, improved and added upon and so forth. Um, but the game is Bard's Tale 3 <laughs> under the hood. Um, but the issue was, is that um, it was the first game I did that was in double high res. So it was the first Apple II game I did that rejected the very first branches of the Apple II. Because back then, the Apple II, 2 Plus... Uh, was now the small minority of Apple IIs. Everybody was using Apple IIEs, two Cs, and two GSs, and all of them double high res. And there were so many visual effects I wanted to do that you really couldn't do in standard res. So, got permission to go ahead and do the game in double high res. And of course, from that, did the C64 and the other and the um, other versions using those very high end graphics. Um, but then, um, just the whole idea was make an open-ended world with open-ended stories and this entire ranking system, this is all under the hood, in which you would then mark what accomplishes you've done and it would make different trees of conversations with people later on. So like if you busted out of the prison, many of the storekeepers would uh, charge you high prices and be in some places stores didn't even exist because you're wanted criminals. Whereas others, if you got out from winning the gladiator, you get discounts on everything and everybody's open and people are saying, oh, you're the big gladiators. I saw you, you know, I was in the stands watching uh, you fight. Um, so the game, depending on how you even start off and how you solve certain puzzles is not the same game twice. So you could play Dragon Wars like four or five different times. And if you change how you play it, the game will change with you and 
it's a totally different game, totally different ending. In fact, some cases there, there's adventures that are locked to you that you cannot ever play because you did one thing. But if you play it a different way, there's a whole new sub adventure that uh, you never knew about. It's like, what the heck is this? Um, and compacting that all onto three floppy disks was a challenge. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I'm very quite satisfied with it. And of course, people who play Dragon Wars, um, you know, they, they love the game. Um, but unfortunately, that was also the time when people were starting to want first person style um, adventure games. Um, so again, the genre was changing. So even though Dragon War sold well, I had two things against me. One, it was, you know, still doing a classic blobber RPG. And second, it had to be a new franchise mm. because I couldn't use the word Bard's Tale because due to the fact that Interplay and Electronic Arts had a falling out, um, they said, Wasteland and Bard's Tale, no soup for you. You, know, you can't have these. You mentioned that Dragon Wars was developed on the um, on the Apple II in, mm -hmm. in the higher resolution. Um, we were lucky enough to interview Richard Garriott some time back, yep. and he mentioned how, in his opinion, he clinged on to the Apple II for too long in his development, and he should have he should have moved on sooner. Were you at risk of doing that, or were you did you did you leave it at the right time? Do you think I left it at the right time? But for me, many other people would say I was on it way too long. Like I was doing three DO games on my Apple II. What? <laughs> Out how of does this that world. Work? <laughs> well, here's how it works. You have a Macintosh to do the compilation, but all the data processing and stuff, I did it on my Apple too. Like when I was doing the um, port of S Out of This World, I first did it on the Super Nintendo, which I used the 2GS as the development system. So I used an Apple II with a car, uh, my, a th I call it the Sluggo 3, but it was a ROM emulator and it plugged it into a. Um, so I didn't even use a Nintendo Super Nintendo dev kit. I used a ROM emulator and so forth, but wrote all the code on the Apple II. So the same, the same premise, the same technology that you were that you'd put together over ten years prior. This ROM emulator. It's you actually just twenty it years. Twenty years earlier. Because let me think, see here. I did the ROM emulator started in nineteen seventy nine, and I did Out of This World in nineteen ninety one. Okay, so that would put it eighteen years. Yeah. 12 years difference. No, isn't no it? 12 years. So 12 years right. difference. Yeah, 12, 12 years, years difference. difference. But yeah. in this case, I actually had a device I had manufactured called oh, okay. um, a Sluggo with the circuit boards and stuff because now I didn't have to wire wrap because now I knew how to make circuit boards. <laughs> okay. um, but this goes back to hey, you know, I figured stuff out. Yeah, so let's jump to this then. So you mentioned Out of This World or Another mm -hmm. World as we knew yep. it over on our shores, uh, originally by Eric Chahi. Yep. Um, now now you, you developed the Apple II. GS and the Super Nintendo version. And the 3DO um, version. And the 3DO version, which is yep. wonderful. So uh, I have to tell you, the 3DO version that we've got here, people come to the museum here and, and they're very familiar with the game on the Amiga and they think the Amiga See what is, I'm pointing at? That you're painting pointing on at the wall? a frame of the game, is that? Yep, that's the actual painting in the back of the opening scene of, of Out of This World 3DO. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's the actual painting, of course, because it came from the animation. So it's so it's a cell from the animation company. Yep, because what Amazing. happens is that the original um, version on the Amiga was done with polygons exclusively on the Amiga using Eric Chahi's scripting language. Mm -hmm. For the three DO, came with an idea saying, "Hey, why don't we have actual hand drawn backgrounds? Mm -hmm. But it has to work with the game." So I took every, I, again, developing on the Apple II, I used the 2GS version of the game and I modified the scripting language so it would only draw the backgrounds. I screen captured each one of them. Then I wrote another program which put up the masks. Okay, yep, yep. The and then I would have masks. an overlay. So it says, all right, I want the people to take this image, draw a brand new image that looks kind of like this, but see this line with the mask? You must still follow that mask. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like the background draw, do whatever you want. It's just a background. Make it as pretty as you like, etc. But as And the rockets in the foreground, it's also got to be that pretty. But this line, thou shalt not pass. And I did that for every single background. There's like 70 of them. We sent it to an animation studio who actually does backgrounds for cartoons. 
And they came back with each one of them. And sometimes I had to make a little adjustments and so forth, but every one of them, I then had them scanned, put them into the game. And again, I had to rewrite the scripting language. So instead of the game loading in the actual background or drawing the background, instead it just loads a file from the CD and just loads this file, shows the file on the screen, and I had it cached as well, so that when you go from screen to screen, there's no load because it's already preloading it for you. And that's why the game looks so beautiful on the 3DO. It does. It does. And that's, as I was saying, when people come to the museum, they come assuming they know the best version of the game and they think it's the Amiga. And then I'll fire up the 3DO and it's like, wow, why does it look so good? And now, thanks to you, I can add another fact to it. I can say, and it was developed on an Apple II GS. <laughs> yep. That, all that, that stuff was there. done because all the scripting, <laughs> I had an, a compiler, an editor, and it was all in a 2GS. So when I was, because the the scripts that were done for the game was custom for the 3DO version. So I would just say, okay, if 3DO, then don't call this, load it, and I added an extra opcode saying pick number four, which would load in picture number four from the disc and put it up on the screen. So I had to do extensions. So it was not true. This is a lot of custom work was done to make that version. But now the version's there, it, it works great. Fantastic. I've got another viewer question here from Stephen. Yeah, my question is about optimization for Out of This World on the Super Nintendo using the DMA register space to hold a scan line draw routine that ran full speed even when using cheaper, slower ROM cartridges. To your knowledge, was this technique ever used in another game or is it totally unique? I think it's totally unique because um, most games that um, needed that level of speed, the companies that were making those games weren't as cheap as Interplay was. <laughs> yeah, because one of the things that, that's like a little hidden secret, Interplay was always on the verge of bankruptcy. I mean, from the day we were founded, um, we only had like six months, uh, a year's worth of capital. And if we didn't start bringing in money, we were out of business. And that never stopped. And all the way through, up until the day that Interplay did run out of money, it was constantly a, a struggle to find sources of revenue or investment because the company constantly was needing that next um, amount of money. So, of course, it meant that when we were doing the cartridges for Super Nintendo, um, there was a huge financial motivation to make these cartridges as cheap as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the Apple 2GS version, I did that port on my own because the prototype was on the 2GS. And all I did was just finish the port. But Interplay had no interest whatsoever in manufacturing the game because, you know, we would have to build the cart, the, the boxes and make the discs, which cost money. It was like about $10,000 of the time in order for us to print a thousand because uh, it cost us something around anywhere from um, five to ten dollars per box to manufacture. I mean, I don't know the specific number, so I'm only making an educated guess. But it was not trivial because if we manufactured this, even a $20,000 manufacturing cost, if the game didn't sell, that's $20,000 down the drain. And Interplay was like, that would be a lot of money and that could hurt. Um, but I contacted the Big Red Computer Club and they said, sure, we will pay the $20,000. So I'm, sorry, I, I'm not familiar with who the Big Red Computer Club are. We, I don't think we had them over here. So uh, no, they were, were they? a United States based company. What they did is when the 2GS uh, computer was basically being removed from the shelves of um, stores so that you couldn't buy 2GS versions of games anymore in stores, mm -hmm. because, again, they were selling so few that stores really didn't have a need. They want to put shelf space for the latest PlayStation 2 game. The Big Red Computer Club had realized that there was a bunch of 2GS games that had um, that were developed but never shipped. Mm, so they contacted okay. all these companies and they went ahead and said, hey, you've got a game that you haven't shipped or you're still shipping, but, you know, you got this inventory in your warehouse and you know what to do it. We'll buy it and then we'll, we'll sell it because through our newsletters and at the time now a fledgling website, um, to for people who, hey, we love our Apple II GS. We'd love some more games for it. Right. Okay. So you approached them, and they seemed like so the I approached them perfect and distributor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I said to them, hey, uh, would you like a brand new game, never before released, and we'll put it in the official interplay packaging of Out of This World? And they said, that's that Amiga game. 
awesome. <laughs> so I sent them a copy of the game. They played it on the 2GS. They're like, we have to possess this. <laughs> so um, they then um, told Interplay, we'd like to buy 1,000 copies. And Interplay said, um, we will only sell it to you for, you know, we'll do it for like twenty or $30,000, no, $25,000. You know, you have to buy 1,000 copies for $25,000, which of course, you know, with markup and stuff, it didn't cost us $25,000. It cost us a lot less, but we still had to ship the game. Um, once that occurred, they said, sure. And of course, Interplay said, no backsies. Once we send you these <laughs> car- games, you're they're yours. You're yeah. not getting any refunds. So of course, they said, sure. So they wrote us a check. And Interplay, true to the word, made the car, the boxes and shipped them out. And of course, you know, uh, the management was going like, stupid fools. They're going to have a <laughs> warehouse of a thousand copies. And then a few months later, Big Red said, we want to reorder. We sold out. <laughs> it's like, what? So it's OK. So we made another thousand copies. I don't know how many shipments we did to them, but every time it's like, what the hell? <laughs> what the? Um, but of course it ended up becoming the, the last commercially made Apple two GS game. So I had the dubious honor of making the first Cast times in tone town and the last out of this world, um, that was in official packaging and so forth. Cause I know there were other games that came out later. Heck, I made one called Ultima one, but they were done in Ziploc bags for independent companies, but not like a major publisher. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, I mean, you mentioned the interplay being on the brink, and and the you know the decisions to not, for example, publish that game. So you had to find other ways. Mm-hmm. Were you as a, as a co-founder? Were you involved much at all in management decisions? At interplay? No. Remember, my self esteem was such that I all I wanted to do was code. It was something I was good at, and as long as people left me alone, I'm good. Um. In order to be a CEO, which now I am, so now I know, um, which, of course, my personality at the time, I would have never been able to survive any sort of C-level executive at any company. It wasn't until decades later when I actually got the skills and my self-esteem back that uh, I was capable of uh, running a company. Sure. Did you at least have... um you know, from, from the initial setup of the company, did you at least have some shares that you were rewarded through? Okay. So you were rewarded a little bit more, hopefully in a profitable year than than a regular employee. Well, the thing was that we never had profit sharing. Okay. No, we never, ever, ever had profit sharing. That was again, one of those things where interplay, we never had profits. Yeah. Um, you know, granted the company was growing and of course, you know, certain people were paying themselves insane salaries. But that was partially why there was, the company was constantly running out of money because these people were getting these insane salaries. Uh, I was not one of them. <laughs> um, but back to what I was saying was that the um, I finally did get my reward because in one of the ever-growing quests for more money, in 1994, Interplay got an investment from MCA, uh, Universal Pictures. MCA is their parent company. So basically Universal Pictures. They put in $45 million into the company to buy 45%, which meant now that my stock was worth, you know, several million dollars. Yeah. Um, yeah, Okay. So all those years of minimum wage. All those years of minimum wage. Oh, I'm glad glad there's a happy ending there somewhere. (laughs) Yeah. Well, put it this way. Put it this way. If it wasn't for that money, I could not have found a logic work. There was no Mm. way in the world I could have founded my own company. It's like after leaving Interplay, I would have had to basically find a job elsewhere or basically start thinking about, you know, what do I want to do for my retirement kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good point to draw to to the to the end of the interplay years. Then mm-hmm. there is just one final question on interplay from viewer yeah. Jake. We had a couple of questions about the Castle series, but I'm not sure you had any part in the. No, the that would be series, Quil- no. uh, you need to talk to Bill Fisher. Bill okay. Fisher is the man. You want castles? You talk to him. He will tell you. He's castles. He's the man. Okay, He's so. The man. Uh, John and Andy, who asked about those, we'll, we'll, tr- we'll save them for Bill Fisher if we if we are able to chat to him. But Jake asks to you, um, just before we leave Interplay, of all the games either cancelled or left on the cutting room floor at Interplay, which one would you be most interested in reviving or completing? Dragon Wars 2. Um, okay. I would do that in a heartbeat. 
Um, I Should we call plot. that Bard's Tale 5? <laughs> Technically Bard's Tale 5. Um, now, granted, um, yeah, there is a Bard's Tale 4. Um, so, yeah, it would be Bard's Tale 5. Um, I mean, I have my own original franchise based on the same idea, but it gets back to getting the money together to be able to do it justice because, you know, to do any sort of an RPG, even if it's a low-budget blopper, still starts off around a million dollars unless you have a bunch of friends who are willing to do uh, free art for you. Um, but yeah, uh, Dragon Wars 2 was one where we came up with concepts and so forth, but because the fact that Dragon Wars, while it broke even, it didn't really set the world on fire. And we were moving then from um, that to things like Descent, and of yeah. course, Doom came out, and then Quake, and that was the new hots. So that's the reason why Dragon Wars Two never really got past the um, the the concept phase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, there's your answer. Um, who asked that, Jake? There's your answer. You mm -hmm. mentioned Doom there, which you did work on on the mm -hmm. on the three DO. Yep. Um, but we'll skip ahead now to about I think it was 1995, um, I believe, when you formed Logicware yep. and moved on from Interplay. It sounds like it was the right time for you to move on from it Interplay. It was. Yeah. yeah. I look back and realize that after nine, oh, hell, once we got the MCA um, investment, Interplay really changed because it was one thing where before Universal Pictures came into the company and made that big investment, we were still doing whatever we wanted because we had no one to answer to. So even though it was like every quarter, it was like, we got to you know make money, we got to figure out how to make payroll, we got th that constant screaming and yelling and, and stuff like that. Once we got the money from uh, MCA, things changed at Interplay in which they were spending money on all these different projects because they had all this money. So they were just blowing it everywhere. But no one ever stopped to think, do these games really need these budgets? Um, you know, like, do you really need a C Sim City CD ROM in which the game itself is just Sim City? And the only thing you did was if you click on a building, it shows a little pop up video. That's all it did. It's like, did it? actually add anything did it do all these other and there were so many canceled projects at interplay and we were making so many stuff i mean the things that we ended up doing being good at was doing those star trek games but even then you know wrath of vulcan fury that was one big money pit um but once it happened now universal pictures said now has a first people on the board of directors and their only answer that uh interplay had to say was how are you profitable this quarter? When do you plan on being profitable? When are you planning on doing this? And every three months, we had to do the same dance, which was how can we ship a game on this date so we can book those numbers so we can put them on the spreadsheet to appeal um, to appease our new corporate masters? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. at this point, there was just so much backstabbing, so much uh, lying, so much... Um, just it wasn't interplay anymore yeah it just pre wasn't presumably with the with the uh you know the, the shares that you profited from you now had a certain amount of freedom to make yeah. an easier decision oh yeah um and that decision was to make uh was to form logic where uh you, you mentioned you were the ceo there yeah but did you did well you i still wasn't put... the ceo i was actually CTO. Oh, okay. i had a business CTO. part it wasn't my first ceo job wasn't until contraband entertainment 1999 Right. Okay. So you're a CTO. Did you did you position yourself still in a programming role yes. there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because um, my problem was is that once the leaving at Interplay was kind of a sudden thing, and I wasn't let's say planning on it or preparing because in order for you to start up your own video game company, you got to at least take some business courses and stuff to learn all the nuances. So what it is, I work with a business partner who knew all that crap. Right. Okay. So yep. he took care of that stuff. I simply recruited the talent and then managed all the projects to just make certain that we hit our milestones and get the games out. Um, and of course, then it was my turn to say, oh, God, I got to get the money and I need to get this check in <laughs> so I can make payroll. So forth. So now it's my job to get that stuff taken care of. <laughs> um, but after, yeah. But after four years, uh, you know, the company basically folded and um contraband entertainment was formed which went back to our roots because our problem is that we went into doing mac game publishing but yeah so, um, so logic where we're, we're focused on 
porting games largely to the Mac from yes. around about 1995. So Doom, Tempest 2000, Quake 2, Alien v Predator. Yep. Uh, I mean, I'm, pro- I'm kind of repeating myself. I asked you the question about 1983. Was that a good time to set up a video game company? And you explained why. 1995, you know, the iMac was three years away. The iPod was six years away. This was not the Apple that we know today. So it was 1995 a good time to set up a video game it was company because around you see, Apple? When Logic was formed, we were doing 3DO games. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So our first games was Wolfenstein 3D, yeah. then Doom, then uh, Casper, the Friendly Ghost, then Shadowin, and then there was Kingdom of the Far Reaches. Um, I was churning out like a game every few months. Um, okay. And so it that wasn't is purely Mac focused. Then. No, no. We, no, in no, fact, no. we had, I mean, I did an occasional Mac port, but this was for Mac Play. Right. Because remember, the Interplay had a division that was formed like in 1992, I believe it was, called Mac Play. And I did a lot of the Mac ports for that, both while I was in Interplay and then later on Logicware. The trouble was that when the around 1997, Mac Play was kind of winding down, and I saw an opportunity to basically fill in the void. And then that's when, because we were doing a port called Shattered Steel for Interplay, and uh, it was supposed to be for Mac Play. But when Mac Play kind of said, we don't, you know, the game's done, but we don't really care about it, and says, well, why don't I publish it? And I said, okay. So they wrote a check, uh, wrote a contract. I wrote them a check for advance on royalties, and we started publishing it. And then came other interplay titles like Tempest 2000, um, Baldur's Gate, and so forth. But then also uh, we did um, other companies like Jazz Jack Rabbit 2. Um, and um, then we did the port for id for Quake 2. Um, then, yeah, you know, so we did all, and then there was Sin, Heavy Metal Fact 2, so forth. And we started publishing all these games. And then later on, um, Mac Play as a brand was sold to a friend of mine. And then I went to business with him. And then that's why Mac Play, I was still doing Mac Play ports, had nothing I to do can. with Interplay, but um, I was doing Mac Play. And that's essentially in 97 and 99, we were doing the publishing. But then when we were started this new business arrangement, then there was no reason for Logic to keep um, publishing. And we had a bunch of debt. Plus, there was other issues to deal with. So we, it was the best thing to do was just bankrupt the company, incorporate a new company, Contra Entertainment, and just focus on development. Don't do any of that publishing nonsense. Let other people deal with it. And that's when we did a bunch of 3DO uh, ports to PC, like... Um, there was Myth 3, The Wolf Age we did, and another one we did called um, Heroes of Might and Magic 4. <laughs> Becky, I'm very aware of how generous you're being with your time. So I'll just fast forward now towards the later years. Uh, there is one question I just need to ask about the late 90s, which is um, Half-Life for the Mac. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? That, that had smashed it written all oh, over it. Oh, it was, it was a smash it. Oh. Apple pissed off Valve. <laughs> That's the long story short. Okay. We, because we did such a great job on Quake 2, uh, we were approached by Sierra because Valve was interested in porting Half-Life to the Mac because they had a conversation with somebody at Apple, some games evangelist, who said that they would sell 500,000 copies on the Mac. So, of course, they said, we're not going to turn down a market like that. We'd be idiots. So yeah. let's go ahead and commission a company to go ahead and do the port. It will be get all the trimmings. It'll be a first class version. And with that kind of income, you know, selling 500,000 copies, you know, no, no brainer, no problem. So they came to us. We then looked at the code, says, here's your price. And they said, very reasonable. Let's do this. We will even throw in an early completion bonus that if you finish this game on this date or earlier, we're going to give you an extra 20 K. It's like, <laughs> we're on. <laughs> so I dedicated three people and we were working on that because we, all of us were like half life, half life, <laughs> half life, you know, working on one of the top franchises ever and getting it onto the Mac. In fact, there was a time in which we had a beta of the game and it, because it was the Mac version, if you look at the servers, it would have like a windows logo, a Linux uh, logo and an, an Apple logo, which over people say, wait a minute. <laughs> who's running an Apple version, which of course we had to change it to the Windows logo because like, oops, <laughs> we didn't let that out. But what happened next, which is of course goes down in infamy. We were about three weeks from shipping 
the game was done. We were only just fixing bugs. Basically, play it. Oh, it looks like there's a rendering issue here. Oh, it looks like we got some little scripting issue here. But that was it. The game was done. We were going online, playing network games against other people on Half-Life. Um, and we even had it compatible enough that uh, if you took some of their, some people's C code and so forth that for their mods, we just compile it on the Mac and they just ran. Um, the only time, if there was Indian issues, would be the only time they would break. But otherwise, it would work. So, um, so we were like, yay, the game's over. And then, of course, I get this phone call. And uh, I get the first mic rep over at Sierra. I go, like, are you sitting down? I'm like, why should I be sitting down? But yeah, I'm sitting at my desk. We're canceling Half-Life. No. And of course, uh, that, that's what they said. The, the guy said, <laughs> you said, we are canceling Half-Life. And I go, like, why? <laughs> And then he told me why. And I'm like, I want to publish it then. I'm going to publish this game. Um, how much money do I need to buy the rights? And they said, uh, it's not available for any price. By the way, we, we love your work. So we're going to give you your early completion bonus. You know, We're going to pay you in full for the whole contract. We're going to give you the early completion bonus. We're going to give you everything. Um, but there's only one thing we need from you, your silence. Oh, no. And I'm like, <laughs> So what? I can't ask you the next question. Oh, no, you can now because that, that that's old news. But back oh, okay. then, Valve didn't want to have the bad publicity of the real reason of what happened. But they were perfectly happy letting the entire Mac development computer saying, Logicware did a crappy port and they canceled because of the horrible ports. Like, no, they, you don't pay someone their 20,000 early completion bonus if their port was bad. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I actually told everybody, so, okay, um, we're still on the clock technically for Valve, but you can do whatever you want. If you want to take a three-week vacation, go ahead. Um, it's paid for, and we all have our bonuses. So, yeah, everybody's going to get their bonus um, because they were very happy with the word. But here's the truth. As I told you, a representative at Apple told the people at Valve that they're going to sell 500,000 copies, which started this whole chain of events. So, of course, as we were nearing finaling the game, Sierra and Valve were telling the those retailers, all right, let's get our pre-orders. How many copies are going to sell? And they said 50,000. <laughs> okay. Now, to put it in perspective, the Mac market at the time was not very healthy. If you sold 20,000 copies, that's considered a hit. 50,000 copies is basically you have Quake 2. And yeah. that is the reality of the Mac gaming market. And we knew that. You know, like when I was doing games for Logicware, we only sold 8,000 to 20,000 copies per game. That's all. It, but we made our business model based on that because we were based in reality. Um. Well, when people at Valve were wondering, okay, where's the extra zero? Mm. You know, 50,000 copies. We were told we're going to sell 500,000. What's going on here? So they went ahead and contacted their representative at Apple, which is now a new representative because the person beforehand had, you know, had a feather in his cap because they say, I convinced Valve to bring Half-Life to the Mac. Give me a promotion. Oh, now I'm going to go move to another company. Well, the guys over at Valve went to Apple and the Apple rep there says, oh no, that's against company policy. We can't quote you potential sales numbers. And he says, uh, no, your previous guy did. Well, I'm sorry, but we never did it. And of course, I don't know if he did or he didn't. And of course, being told that what somebody actually did and being told that it didn't happen, it kind of pissed off people at Valve. And as a result, it says, for this lying to us, in order to convince us to bring a game on this platform, we will never see the light of day. Oh, Half-Life, and it was then an edict within Valve, no Valve title will ever be ported to the Mac. Period. Wow. And uh, unbeknownst to us, we didn't know about that policy, but ourselves, Mac Play, um, what's it called? Aspire... Um, you know, every single company that made Mac games went to Valve and said, look, here's a check for a hundred grand. Here's our advance on royalties. And they said, nothing less than a million dollars. And it's like, but 
we can't, there is no business model where giving you a million dollars will make us money. It says it's a million dollars or we don't even talk. Oh, wow. And so, and of course, you know, it was really a more of a million dollars because we don't want it on the platform period. So we're pricing it out of the platform. And, oh. um, at that point we then, uh, archived everything and there's a disc right here in my archives actually several copies of it in which the disc is labeled verboten so if anybody comes over and uh, ransacks my office after i die and they see a disc marked verboten and they put it into their mac they will find very familiar files on there <laughs> and an executable that you could play from beginning to end of the 1999 version of uh was it 1978? I forgot what year it was that when that happened, but it, the source code was synced as of that date and it will work fine. And it was cross play with the PC and everything. Uh, maybe one day it will see the light of day, but uh, that brings us up to the turn of the millennium. And um, it, generally where we, where we stop our, our retro stories, but I know you've done so much more beyond <laughs> there. Do you want to just bring us up to speed quickly up to the present day? You know, what, what came next for you, Becky? Well, after um, Contraband Entertainment, it was one of those where um, we were doing contracts for different companies. And then one day we did a contract for Electronic Arts. And then we did a game. It was a game called uh, Medal of Honor Rising Sun. Mm -hmm. Now, that was a story in of itself because there was a studio in Los Angeles called DreamWorks Interactive that just got bought by EA. And they needed to make their ship date. So the call went out. If you have a PlayStation 2 dev kit and a Pulse, report to work right here. <laughs> and there was like 75 programmers on this game. And that, to give you an idea, that's insane. Absolutely <laughs> freaking insane. But they set up a little office for myself and one of my uh, associates. And we were just churning out bugs. You know, I would just say, okay, fix this. This is fixed. Done. And... And shortly, they did this thing with a code review. Like, I would do the fix. Then I would have to call in somebody to do a code review. After a while, it says, look, the people from Contraband, everyone else would doing code reviews. But the people from Contraband, just let them just check their stuff in because they're just churning out bugs. And when it was done, we churned out, we fixed something like uh, more bugs fixed than the second highest person who was on their own team at EA. We were fixing far more bugs than they were. So when the project was done, handshake here's your check they then said how much for your employees <laughs> so we don't want to buy your company we want to buy your employees and i'm like hmm how much are you offering this much hey everybody um why don't we all <laughs> send our resumes to electronic arts and uh you know i'll cl close down the company properly you know no debt no nothing how my landlord says anytime you want to rent off a space you're like one of the few companies who you sign a lease and you fulfill the lease <laughs> and you didn't break it or abandon us or said no 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 you in fact you even cleaned the room so after <laughs> everything's all done you had professionally clean so we could just offer it to new clients you know like anytime just come on down please <laughs> um but we then that's what started my career working for other companies what's hilarious was that that was the first time i actually worked for a company yeah because yeah. you know with avalon hill yeah i worked there but it was very informal when i worked at uh, boone corporation it was also very informal it was never any structure to it but working and like and interplay was never structure oh my goodness there was never ever any structure there and of course, with Logicware and Contraband, I was a CEO, CTO, which, you know, when you're the, the boss, they can never fire you because it's your own company. But at the same time, you're going like, how am I paying everybody this quarter or this month? Um, but Electronic Arts, they said, here's your employee reviews. Here's your employee stuff. It's like, what is all this stuff? And, um, you know, so we had employee policies, retention, stuff like that. Um, but I thought, this is kind of cool. So I don't have to worry about the money. The, the paychecks just magically appear in my bank account. And I just write code. What a novel concept. Um, but then I worked there. Then I worked at Microsoft. I worked at a place called Barking Lizards. Then um, Microsoft and Sony, I worked there, both of them at the advanced technology groups. So I know a lot of stuff under the scenes of many consoles. But then um, after the Sony layoff, I was uh, at a party with some friends of mine at RJ Michael's house. 
And we're a bunch of old women sitting there just grousing about how nobody's hiring old women in the video game industry. And that's when we said, well, let's form our own company. It's not like I don't have experience doing this stuff. And hence, Old School was born. And it was called Old School because every one of us was well in our 50s. Oh, nice to hear RJ Michaels involved as well as a, as a fan of the Amiga. Um, I got to meet last weekend, just as an aside, um, uh, Ron Nicholson. He was at an mm. Amiga Island convention, the, the mm-hmm. guy behind the Amiga Blitter. And he had some wonderful stories to tell. So it was really yeah. nice to meet one of those names that's uh, inscribed on the inside of the case on the 1000. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I remember that when they did the 3DO, many of the people there came for the Amiga, which is why there's so yeah. many similarities between the Amiga and the 3DO, hardware and software-wise. Yeah, sure. And of course, you could recognize them. And I guess that's my final question for you is on reflection. Uh, you know, you've been in the industry for so long. How do you keep yourself current when it comes to the ever changing platforms, the engines, all of these things that you have to learn and juggle? How do you stay on top of it? all? Remember, I told you I had an insipi- insatiable appetite for knowledge mm-hmm. that has never <laughs> left me. Even to there this day, go. I crack open books. I crap. Well, nowadays, it's all PDF files these days. But it's the same thing. It's like, uh, like here's my Switch dev kit. Um, over behind me is my Xbox Series One, a uh, Series X dev kit right here. That's the Series X. Down here is the Xbox 360 and the Xbox Classic. Over here is the PlayStation 5. There's another PlayStation 4. This white box I think you can see here, that's yep. a Stadia dev kit. Oh, okay. Yeah. We've got uh, company I, next to you as well has just appeared there. Yeah, there's my Stadia. Um, <laughs> And I was even working on a Stadia game before they shut it all down. I mean, I w- that would have been my most recent game was Luxor Evolved to be released on Stadia. Now, instead, it's coming out on Switch, Xbox uh, One, and uh, PlayStation 4, 5. But Fantastic. that's what I'm working on now. What a lovely way to wrap it up. So if we want to find out what you're working on and just follow your progress, where should people go? Two places. Yep. Both of them on Twitter. You want to follow everything going on with my company, which really is just me and a couple of other people, but that's it, um, is Old School, O-L-D-E-S-K-U-U-L. Follow Old School on Twitter, or if you want to find out my shenanigans, usually stories between me and the cats, um, or my comic co, Sailor Ronco, is Burger Becky, like hamburger, Becky, put it in one word, and Burger Becky. Follow that on uh, Twitter. And by the way, Old School and um, Burger Becky are their own domain names for .com, so you can go to their respective websites. But that's how you can track me down. And of course, you know, since I do you know, know how to shoot, I will defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to go really old school, BurgerBecky.com does have your ICQ number. I'm not sure if you still log on, but it's still... <laughs> it is still my ICQ number, actually. Um, and I, I, I think I logged onto it recently just to make sure my credentials work. And yeah, it does. It's just, of course, like 90% of all my um, connections or something, my like contacts are either disabled or... You know, so last to contact in 1997 or something like that. <laughs> Becky, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a joy to hear your stories. And, and thank you also for the games. I mean, uh, amounting to nearly 300 games that you're credited on. It's an yeah. illustrious career. So on behalf of everyone that's viewing, thank you so much. And yes. um, Thank you yeah. very much for having me on. And 300 games is what happens when you turn a game out every month or two for 10 years. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's episode. If you enjoyed it and like what I do on the channel, join the official Cave Dwellers over at patreon.com forward slash RMC Retro.